a link to Medify and timestamps on each section are available in the description. Well, hello there. I see that you found this video from probably typing in. I'm so sure you got this help. And don't you worry, because this video will help you so much. I fully understand the stress that you cut. I've seen a lot of comments on Shadow Capstuff's page saying, Can you make a video with a practice? Well, what would you say? What would you say? What would you say? using it? And I have been sent by Medify to tell you how to absolutely destroy the UCAT. And by destroy, I mean get a very high score. But the problem is, my name is James Pendleton, and I haven't actually taken the UCAT. And in order to help you guys, I need to find someone that has. <laughs> Okay, so I just came out of the exam. I haven't checked my results yet, so I'm gonna check it now. I, I, do, I, could, I think I might have done shit, I might have done good, I don't know, because like, that exam was fucking hard. Oh, let's have a look. It's black and white. Oh, oh, oh shit! Oh my god! Oh my god! What the fuck? Hello there, Sire. I can't believe. Who are you? Medify have actually sent me because um, they're looking for people with really um, high scores to help people that aren't really getting those high scores. Wait, so you're saying my score's sick? <laughs> yes. Not to be your ego or anything, Sophia, but your score is pretty high. Wait, um, what? what is it? What company did you say you're from again? Because, like, who are you? Oh, it's uh, Medify, a resource you used twice because you didn't get in last time. Okay, you didn't have to go into that detail because it's a very sensitive subject. If you look at the end results, they I nearly cried, so, okay, by nearly I might not actually cried. Wait a minute. So if I'm doing a video with you, that means I'm sponsored by Medify. Yeah! I wouldn't say sponsored. Listen, I beg you just say I'm sponsored so I look sick in front of the gang. Yeah! Okay, yeah, sponsored. <laughs> Yo guys, welcome back to Shower Caps. And first I just want to apologize. Like, I don't even know who that James Pendleton guy was. Like, what was he doing doing my intro? Like, is he stupid? But let's move on to the main point of this video. So this video is aimed at people that are gonna do the UCAT in 2020 or years to come. And whilst a lot of the videos on YouTube about UCAT are very informative, I feel like they're very clunky and there's a lot of things they can cut out and just go straight to like the juicy bullet points that you need to know. So straight away for the people that don't know who I actually am. My name is Sufjan Khan and I applied to dentistry in 2019 and 2020. You're probably asking why. Um, I didn't get the grades the first time round. But the first time round in 2019, my score was 2,600, 650 average. That's in the 69th percentile and I got an office fit from King's, Queen Mary's, University of Manchester and rejection from Bristol. My preparation entailed using Medify for two weeks and the 1,250 UK CAT question book. And for 2020 entry, I got a score of 2,940, which is a 735 average, which is in the 99th percentile, and I got also into from King's, King's ESDP, Sheffield, Plymouth, and rejection from Noah because me, yeah. And I used just Medify for a whole month. And straight away in a 340 difference in UCAT scores, you just tell for me, using Medify for a month was so much better than using it for two weeks alongside the book. So that's the first point I'm going to say. You should revise UCAT for a month. For people that like time pressure and like the old, oh, it's like very soon, two weeks is pretty good. But for me, I feel like I could have done a lot better if I did it with that month strategy. And the risk of doing it for more than a month is that you peak early and you actually do worse than you do in the mocks you do on Medify, for example. Those are my key starting tips I would use for the UCAT. And now let's jump straight in to verbal reasoning. Verbal reasoning has 44 questions, 11 sets of four in 21 minutes. So that's like two minutes, two minutes, two minutes on each passage. It's a mixture of true, false, can't tell, and comprehension questions. My scores for 2019 entry was 600 and 2020 entry, 580. <laughs> so you're probably thinking to yourself, why did I kick off this video when this guy did dead twice in a row? And the reason that I thought I did bad twice was because I just did the same thing twice. The main point that I had from verbal reasoning is do not just look at the question and then look at the text. Because that's what I did twice. Like, am I stupid? Okay guys, so this is what Medify looks like. There's a learn section where you look at video tutorials about every single section. I highly recommend that. The practice section which I'm going to go on now to show you how to answer all the questions. And the simulate section which I'll show you has mini mocks and full mocks which replicate exactly what you'll feel in the exam. So the first area we're going to cover is verbal reasoning, true, false, can't tell. So you probably see this really long text and think, do I actually have to read all of it? You don't. One of the key things about verbal reasoning is skim reading. I feel like I didn't really do that well in other verbal reasoning tests because I saw a text this and was like, I am not reading the whole thing. I'm gonna go straight to the question and then look for the text. Don't do that. Like, just don't, it doesn't work. The first thing I do is look over the whole thing, just look at it. And you can already see it's about New Zealand and rugby. Straight away, that should be in your mind. New Zealand rugby, yeah. And then you can see three paragraphs, so you should get a key point from each paragraph. First thing, Australia beat New Zealand 32 to 12 in the 2006, remember that key date? The All Blacks entered the match as firm favourites despite the Wallabies' strong touch to the season. I feel like this sentence is going to be quite important because All Blacks, Wallabies, they're nicknames, but you don't know which one's which, so that's going to be very important to bear in mind. Winning three from three on the new coach, John Connolly. New coach, John Connolly, remember that? Okay, so first paragraph is about the school, the year, and nicknames. Straight away done. Okay, second paragraph. Recovered the ball, sprinted down. Okay, this is talking about a point. 
was sent to the sim bin 27th minute. Okay, yeah, this is talking about the game and what happened in it. That one man Australia was not able to hold out the All Blacks. Okay, from this you could tell Australia are not called All Blacks. So therefore you could say that Australia are Wallabies and New Zealand are All Blacks. And a lot, I think the last sentence will be quite important as well. The All Blacks entered a half-time break lead in the Wallabies 14 points to seven. For the second paragraph, we've established that the Wallabies are Australia and the All Blacks are New Zealand. And also it's a whole summary about the game and at halftime it was 14 to seven. Okay, now for the third paragraph. I can already see this is talking about the second half of the game. So if there's a question about the second half of the game, I'd instantly refer to this paragraph. Both second and third paragraph are very detailed. And I feel like if you read it thoroughly, your head will start to hurt and you'll have so much information in your head that you don't really need. So I'd say when there's a question talking about either first half or second half, go to these paragraphs and then read it. And then at the end of the last paragraph, Australia faces South Africa at the Suncorp Stadium in Brisbane next week. I feel like that'll be quite a key point. Okay, now to the question. The All Blacks are the New Zealand team. Okay, as we can tell in the first paragraph, we didn't really know if they were actually the All Blacks were the New Zealand team. But as established in the second paragraph, the All Blacks are the New Zealand team. So true. A converted try at seven points. Okay, the way that we know about this question is looking at the second and third paragraph as they're talking about what happens in the game. So when I see a question like this, I'd skim through the second and third paragraph looking for seven points or try. It's called a try. Sterling was going to try to take Australia out by seven points. Okay, that is the key sentence. So converted the try to take Australia out by seven points, meaning a converted try is seven points. A penalty goal is worth three points. Okay, once again, skim from there and go down. And look for the word penalty and three points. Kicking. A successful penalty goal to score 17 points to seven. Okay, so the score before 17 points seven was 14 to seven. So you can infer that a penalty goal is worth three points because 17 minus 14 is three guys. So that is true. Let's go. Okay, Australia play the Springboks next week. Okay, Australia faces South Africa. You don't know South Africa's nickname, so they could be called the Springboks. So as a result, it's can't tell. A drop goal is worth three points. Okay, so once again for this, you have to skim through the second and third paragraph for drop goal and three points. Okay, after skimming the second and third paragraph, I could not find drop goal. As a result, I'm going to say can't tell. One of the biggest points about verbal reasoning, in my opinion, is do not use context. Like, I know for a fact a drop goal is worth three points, but because it's not mentioned in the text, I can't say it's true. So therefore, it's can't tell. And let's see what I got. Three, two, one. There we go. Yes, let's go. So after that little walkthrough of verbal reasoning, I have four key tips for you. So number one, the first question you should ask yourself is what is the text about? The second point is skim read and have a key talking point for each paragraph to refer back to. Number three is look for key dates and do not use contextual knowledge. Please just don't do that because you'll get a lot wrong. Number four is watch out for conditional words in the question such as at least, more than, less than, exactly and approximately. That fourth point is really important for comprehension questions. Comprehension questions are very similar to true, false, can't tell, however there's more words. Meaning looking out for words such as exactly and approximately and distinguishing between both is very important. Now for a decision making breakdown. You have 29 questions in 31 minutes so basically like a question per minute. There's two types of questions. Drawing conclusions which contain logical puzzles, interpreting information, Venn diagrams and probability and evaluating arguments. My score for decision making in 2019 was 680 and in 2020, 760. So once again, here's a walkthrough of decision making. Okay, so now let's go on to decision making, drawing conclusions. A way that is as similar to verb reasoning is straight away, read the text before you do anything. Okay, a pharmacist are company trialing a new antibiotic for the treatment of a bacterial infection known as XY. Okay, they have developed two new types of antibiotic, a long acting form called 1AL and a short acting form called 1AS. They are testing their effectiveness on a group of mice with XY and are using a control group that are being treated with a drug currently used in standard clinical practice. Okay. Before we look at the diagram, let's read the question. Place yes if the conclusion does flow, place no if the conclusion does not follow. Okay. 1AL is best at reducing symptoms of disease. Okay. This is where we look at the diagram. 1AL is this line, 1AS is this line, the control is this line. If you look at the y-axis and look at the x-axis, it's talking about percentage survival and days. It's not talking about reducing the symptoms, so therefore, conclusion does not follow. Okay, second question, between 100 and 200 days, 1AL is best at improving survival. Okay, okay, looking at 100 and 200 days, you can tell that 1AL is actually better than both AS and the control, so I'd say yes for that. Between 300 and 400 days, 1AL is best at improving survival. Okay, 300 and 400 days, there's actually an overlap. Meaning that the control is actually better in some cases than the AL, so therefore you cannot prove that. People most benefit from 1AL from days 0 to 250. If you look at the graph, there's a higher percentage of survival, but most benefit, you can't make that conclusion in my opinion. Beyond the end of the trial, the control drug was most effective at enabling survival. So after 1AS and 1AL finished, the control actually stays on. So I would say yes to that. 
Okay, let's have a look what we got. There we go. So once again, the key points about decision making, number one, read the text first, literally the same as verbal reasoning in that aspect. Number two, do not make any assumptions. For example, in the question I asked about, um, what was it, survival rates and symptoms. Just because survival rate is high doesn't mean there's less symptoms, like there's no correlation between those two. And number three, maybe the biggest thing is use your whiteboard. This is especially important in Venn diagram and probability questions, where you might have to draw a tree diagram to do um, probability questions, or calculating a number in a Venn diagram, for example. And another way this is very similar to verbal reasoning is that conditional words in the questions such as at least more than less sign are also very important to look out for so let's go on to evaluating arguments decision making which is very different to drawing conclusions should all primary school children learn a second language to improve verbal communication in their native language okay so the main thing about these questions is you cannot be biased you cannot pick an answer that you personally think is right we have to pick an answer where the argument is the strongest as it says here so yes learning a second language often improves confidence that is opinionated and has no evidence to back it up. Yes, learning a second language has boosted brain development of primary school children in 77% of cases. In this example, there's actually evidence to back it up. So right now, I'd take this one. Okay, third one, no, it has been observed that there's no correlation between learning a second language and the improvement of verbal communication in the child's mother tongue. I'm now tempted to click this one, as in the question, at the end of it, it says, to improve verbal communication in a native language. And this is the only argument that actually talks about the native language, talks about child's mother tongue. And that is a big thing in these questions. The end of the question normally indicates what you need to look for in an answer. So the last one, no, too many children cannot read and write a native skill, so effort should be focused on this. In this one, it does not talk about second language at all, therefore I'm rejecting that one. So after looking at all the arguments, I feel like the third one is right, and let's see if I'm right. There we go. Evaluating arguments is very different to drawing conclusions. The two key points out for you is avoid being biased. In the walkthrough I just did, there were a few answers that I'd actually agree with, but you have to be the answer that provides the best argument. And that leads me to my second point. The end of the question often has the evidence you should look for. And now let's go on to quantitative reasoning. Quantitative reasoning has 36 questions in 24 minutes, so that's a question every 40 seconds. There are four topics, algebra, statistics, number, and geometry. My score for 2019 entry was 700, and in 2020, it was 880. Meaning out of the 36 questions, I got about two wrong. But before we even go to a walkthrough, these are equations that I think you have to remember in order to be fast and just great at quantitative reasoning. Okay, so now let's go on to quantitative reasoning. First thing, before you even look at the question, pen and whiteboard. This is a pencil and paper, but same thing. First thing you do is look at all the information. How many offers are to organize of different size tents available to rent? This is the table, okay. Livery fee, which is charged 150% of the cost of renting a tent for one day. Depending on the event, company offers a fixed fee for other costs. Depending on rent, which off per head. Price is shown in the table below, okay. Who charges the price of the table so that 32%, 32.5% of the cost is per head is profit. No profit is made on delivery fee and 90% of the cost. See, look how, look how many things you need to know about this. Okay, question. Jim wants to rent a tent for his birthday party, at which there'll be 50 guests, himself included. If he rents tent A for just one day, how much would that cost him? Okay, okay, so then we gonna have to go through all the data again and work out how much it is. That's what I write is 10 A, 50 guests, one day. 100 pounds for one day. That was the delivery fee, which is 100% of the cost for renting tent one day. Okay, 100 times by 1.5 is 150. So, so far it's 100 plus 150. I did times by 1.5 because 150% is times by 1.5. Now this table is per head as you can see and it's a birthday party so 65 times by 50. Let's have a look at that is so calculator 65 times by 50 and that equals 3250. So then you add 3250 to 100 plus 150 which is 3,500. Is that an answer there? Yes, it is. So I believe that is right. Next question. Pam wants to rent a tent for a wedding. Okay, wedding is written down already. There'll be 95 by 95, including Pam and her other half. Okay, Pam has to rent tent C for two days. C for two days. Okay, now let's do that very quickly. Okay, tent C, 305, two days, which is 610. Then we do 95 people for a wedding, so 95 times by 135, which equals 1,208.25. Add that to 610, and then you get 13,435 is that answer there. That's not, which means I have forgotten something, which is the delivery fee, see? These are mistakes that I'm making. So 1.5 times by the cost of renting the tent for one day, remember that. So 1.5 times by 305, which equals it's £457.50 and you add that to 13435 and that is your answer. Ryan was hold a disco, okay disco, reunion and some of his office friends. If the company will make a 
we guess at event only. How many guesses Ryan invite? Okay, so this is where you need to go backwards. If 2,379 is 32%, if you divide that by 32.5 and times it by 100, you get the 100%, which is 2,379 divided by 32.5 equals that, times by 100 equals 7,320. Okay. Then if you divide that by 40, which is the disco, you're gonna see how many people he invited. Equals 183 people. Okay. However, so how many guests did Ryan invite? It's 183 people, including himself. Therefore, you minus one, 182. See, they're so sneaky, don't you think? Go on, roll. <laughs> okay, so let's see what I got wrong. So what's the right answer? Why is it that? Let's have a look. Um, the question's asking company's profit, not the cost of the wedding. Oh, the answer, the question is about profit. Ah, oh, see, I made a stupid mistake. So as a result, you don't need to buy that delivery cost and just do 32.5% of the okay, I see. You probably thought I was just going to include correct answers here, but I got it wrong. So once again, I got four main points about quantitative reasoning. This section is all about momentum. So skip if you get stuck for more than a minute and flag the question to go back to at the end. During practical quantitative reasoning, use the keyboard calculator because that will mirror exactly how you'll feel and how you perform in the exam. During practical quantitative reasoning, one of the main um, mistakes that I made was conversions. So be careful of units, especially square units. And obviously the strategy that I use, is use your pen and whiteboards, give them the data, read the question, then look for the data that corresponds to the question. Now let's jump into abstract reasoning. You have 11 minutes to answer 55 questions. There are four types of questions, complete series, complete statement, set A, B, and set A, B or neither. My score in 2019 was 620 and 2020, 720. So now we're on um, abstract reasoning. Let's go to abstract reasoning, complete series. Okay. So, with these questions, you have to look at the pattern and you have to complete the series that um, accords to the pattern that is going on in the series. The first thing I do is, I actually have a mnemonic called SCANS. I say I have it, but it's actually Medify. And it goes shape, colour, angles, number, and symmetry. That's what it is. Which thing is complete series? It goes from a heart, to a square, to a circle, to that. Two sides, four sides, one side, four sides. Okay, there's no correlation with that. What about the small shapes? Four sides, three sides, 10 sides, five sides. Hmm. Maybe it's combined sides. One, six, seven, 11, nine, no. Maybe it's one with two shapes, so it's definitely not that. And it is definitely not that. It only overlaps in one corner, so I don't think it's gonna be that. This is the four pieces I do when I can't find a pattern, I just eliminate. So I don't think it's that either because it overlaps and I think it's this one because it overlaps once. Mark test, let's have a look. There we go. Okay, so that's quite a key point that I don't think I have to mention is that there's going to be times where you don't actually find a pattern. So the way that you do it is by process of elimination as I just showed. So now let's go to abstract reasoning, complete statement. So this one kind of speaks to itself. So it's, there's a statement here in terms of shapes and you have to complete the statement in the same way this statement is completed. So. And as you can see here, the shape in the middle goes up by one side, the one in the middle goes down by one, and the one at the outside goes up by one. So I feel like on the outside it's gonna be a square, so it's definitely not the top one. And the middle is gonna be a square, so it's definitely not that one. And then the middle shape goes down by one, so it would be this one as it's a triangle. Let's have a look from right. There we go, okay. Okay, next one is set A, B, or neither. Okay, with set A and set B, there's one distinctive feature that outlines both set A and set B. Patterns, once again, using the mnemonic scans, shape, color, angles, number, symmetry. In set A, I can see a triangle and a circle. And in set B, I can see a square or a quadrilateral and a triangle. In this one, it's a quadrilateral and a triangle. So it could be set B. I'm gonna say it is set B, and I don't think the color is of any relevancy, in my opinion. From what I see, I don't think there's any relevancy. Triangle and a quadrilateral, I think that's set B again. Triangle and quadrilateral, the quadrilateral being bigger. Set B again, quadrilateral and triangle. These are all set B so far. A triangle and a circle, I'd say that's set A. Let's have a look. Okay, I got the first one wrong. Why? This is a good thing about Medify. Once again, tell me why I'm wrong. Neither. Okay. Set A, big triangles. One of the vertices of the triangle has a circle near it. A triangle is being pointed by one of the vertices of the bigger quadrilateral. Ah. Uh, the quadrilateral has to actually point to a vertice of the triangle. And in this one, it's not pointing to any, it's just pointing to a corner. 
Okay, interesting. So I have three key points about abstract reasoning as I talked about in the walkthrough. Number one is use a scans and mnemonics, shape, color, angles, number, symmetry. That is so important. Number two is a point that I really should have used in my first run through review cap. Don't spend more than 30 seconds trying to figure out a pattern. I missed out a good 10 questions at the end of my last um, 2017 review cap abstract reasoning and I really don't want that to be happening to you. Number three, the patterns are only rarely complicated, so don't overcomplicate because normally it's just the shape, color, angle, scans, mnemonic thing. So now let's jump into the final section, SJT, situational judgment. You have six questions 20 scenarios in 26 minutes which is like 23 seconds per question and you have two types of questions appropriateness and importance both are very different in 2017 entry I got band one and 2020 entry I got band one as well okay so now let's go on to situational judgment with situational judgment the best thing you can do is read the scenario then read the question as I've said for verbal reasoning and all that shenanigans Heidi and Frank are two medical students working on a project together recently Frank has not been contributing much to the project and has been prioritizing a social life instead this has angered Heidi because she does not think it is fair and that she puts in all the effort. How important are the following factors for Heidi when deciding how to respond to the situation? Okay, key word is importance. The mark for this project will contribute to the end of the year grade. End of year grade is important. With these questions, you can go forward and actually find a factor that's more important than the one you put very important for, so just bear that in mind. So right now, the mark for this project will contribute to the end of the year grade. I think that's very important considering I haven't seen any other factors. Heidi has better knowledge of the topic that they are working on. I feel like that is not important at all. Just because you know more about something doesn't mean that you should put more effort into it. This is how you have, you have to think like a neek, I can't lie. Third question, Frank is known for being a hard worker and good contributor. That's quite interesting to know, but I don't think that's, in this situation, it's not important at all because in this moment in time, he's prioritizing his social life, so not important at all. Fourth question, Frank has been counseling some family issues recently. I think that's quite important as it could explain why he's prioritizing his social life instead. Friday and Frank have only three days left to complete the project. I feel that's important as it increases the urgency, but I feel like even if it was like two months left, I feel like you still have to encounter the problem. Okay, let's have a look at what we got. Okay, two correct and three partially incorrect. Correct means you got the answer bang on and partially correct means that you got like one off. So for example, if he said like, um, very important, the answer is actually important. Let's see what we got partially correct. Heidi has better knowledge of the topic they're working on, of minor importance apparently. Okay, it's my minor consideration because she may be able to quote you more if she is more informed about the topic. Okay, yeah. However, this does not take away the fact that Frank is slacking. Yep. Frank is known for a hard work and good contributor. I said not important at all, the answer is actually of minor importance. The fact that suggests that Frank's current unhelpful behavior is out of character, meaning there might be an underlying issue. Yeah, that is very, very true. Let's go to the final topic of SJT, which is appropriateness. These are very similar to the importance questions. So you have to read the scenario and then we do the questions. Alex is a medical student coming up to the end of his fourth year. One day he gets text from one of his friends with a picture of a bad rash on her back. They're asking for advice. Alex is on a dermatology rotation and has seen similar rashes before. And so he's confident that he knows what the course is and how to treat it. Okay, how appropriate are the following responses by Alex to this situation? First question, tell his friend what he believes the problem and how to treat it. Key thing, Alex is a medical student. Therefore, he is not in a position to provide advice to his friends and his friend should go to a GP to check out the rash. So therefore, a very inappropriate thing to do. Give his opinion and suggest that his friend should visit a qualified dermatologist instead. I think it's appropriate, but not ideal because refusing is like, ouch, that's a bit rude. But I do feel like the visit of qualified dermatologist said is very appropriate. So I feel like it balances out to appropriate, but not ideal. Third question. I mentioned that he has seen similar rashes before, but advise friends go and seek professional advice. That's a very appropriate thing to do because he's mentioning his opinion, but he's advising his friend to go and seek professional advice because he is a medical student. He is aware that he's a medical student. Fourth one, speak to one of the doctors that Alex is chattering and ask him for their opinion. I think it's a very inappropriate thing to do because he's breaking confidentiality with Alex. And confidentiality is a very important thing when looking at SJT. Fifth question, ignore his friend as there's nothing they can legally do to help. A very inappropriate thing to do because I feel like he can refer him to a dumb or something. So let's have a look at what we got. Okay, two correct, two partially correct again. Second question is partially incorrect because refuse to give his opinion and just that his friend should visit a qualified dermatologist. Apparently it's a very appropriate thing to do. Okay, I feel like he shouldn't give an opinion at all then. Is that what's going on? Yeah, see, look, it may be inappropriate to insinuate that you may have an idea. Okay, so you can't give your opinion at all if you're a medical student. Okay, cool. And once again, for situational judgment, I have five key points for you. Number one, you should do what you think the perfect person would do. One of the best resources I have for you is good medical practice. Just a disclaimer, it's a very, very long booklet, but it will help you so much. It talks about confidentiality, putting patients' interests first. And before reading this book, I was getting like band three, band two, and I probably you straight after reading it, band one was so much more frequent because I was thinking like a doctor slash dentist. My second point is always snake, report. If a person is persistently ignoring you or is drunk, 
My third point is don't jump to the highest punishment. For example, don't go to the head of CQC when you can sort the situation for, out for yourself. Number four, as shown in my walkthrough, medical students must not give a diagnosis to an illness slash pain. And number five, this applies to the importance part. Just because the fact it should be accounted for doesn't mean it's very important. Also, you may have seen that I got some partially correct and correct. If you get an answer partially correct, that isn't necessarily bad. Being one off the answer and having the mindset of a doctor slash dentist and being very stubborn in your views will help you get the band one slash two that you need to get into dental school. So yeah, that is pretty much a rundown of all the sections. If you do end up buying Medify, link in the description, I would highly recommend using their UCAT checklist, which runs you through how to assess your current level, how to prepare, how to practice, how to simulate. And before you guys, I said that you should revise for a month and using the UCAT checklist and my amazing intuition, I'm going to tell you how to structure your month. Your first week should consist of trying questions in the UCAT, just seeing how you are in each section, taking test day on the official UCAT website so you can see how time pressured the UCAT actually is. Then for your second week, I'd recommend doing around 300 questions a day, focus on the topics that you find hard and the ones that you don't really get a high score in. With these questions, do a mixture of time Time practice and just practice without any time pressure. However, in your third week, you should definitely do time practice and definitely do the mini mocks because that will simulate exactly how it is in the exam. Leading up to your UCAT, this is where you need to do the full mocks. There are a total of 11 UCAT mocks you can do, three ones on the official website and there's eight on Medify. I recommend doing two a day with a lot of space between each one. Final mock you should do is the part C of the official UCAT one. And on the day of the UCAT, do not do a mock exam. There's a chance you might do bad in that mock and you'll be disheartened. Full mocks are literally the best way to simulate how you'll do. So yeah, that's how I I structure my month if I was to do UCAT again. Also, if you're unsure on how realistic Medify mocks are compared to the actual exam, these are the results of my Medify mock right before my exam, and these are the results of my exam. Pretty similar. So I really hope this video helped you. And if you have any further questions about UCAT, don't be afraid to DM me at ShadowCapsOff on Instagram. And subscribe for not only dentistry content, but random skits and vlogs of my life. Bye guys. Subscribe to ShadowCapsOff. What you gonna do when going get stuff? Skits, satire and music videos. Do the whole lot. Your mum meets Cheerios. Subscribe to Shower Cat.